So here we are, Mark chapter 12, okay? This incident where Jesus is set about is sought to be tripped up. And uh, it's an account, it's a story, and what do you make of it? Okay, let me put it like this to you. What would it be like to be acting in, say, Macbeth, uh, with Shakespeare looking on and whispering in your ear? What would it be like? Scary because he's dead. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's important that the person who's doing this is alive. Yeah, I'll give you that. But the Bible is the only book whose author is always watching as you read it or expand on it. Yeah? And he is alive and his voice needs to be in our ear. It's the only book whose author is always watching as you read it or expound it. So you need to be careful to listen out for him and what he's saying. What's he saying in this passage? Is it about paying the poll tax? Because I've heard it spoken about so many times, like it's about paying the poll tax, and I'm really not sure that's, that's the point. The passage actually seems to me to be about what happens when you try and handle the things of God without listening to Him. When you handle the things of God as if they're yours for the purposes that you wish to secure for yourself. Um, it, it, it's as if people treat religion as a burger joint where you get your religion the way you want it. Have you come across that particular outlet for burgers? Have it the way you want it. And, and across Wales today, we've got people who are having their religion the way they want it. And that's a big part of our problem. And that was a big part of the problem in Jesus' time as he's about to show and he's about to prove with these individuals. Because they come along with an inquisition. That's basically what he's up against. He's up against people who want to trap him and catch him out in his theology or something so that they can do away with him. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? There's the Inquisition, verses 13 and 14. Then. When? When did this happen? What did, where, where, did all this, where did this Inquisition come from? The preceding context is all about challenge to Jesus' authority. Remember, he's got on the donkey. He's ridden up to Jerusalem. There's been this big acclamation of his authority. He's gone in there and he's cleansed the temple. And they've said, by what authority do you do these things? In chapter 11, 27. And then, as a result of that, he tells the parable of the vineyard. And the parable of the vineyard is about somebody who is uh, the landlord and owns it and he's got sharecroppers in on rent and they've not given back to him what they should have given back to him does that ring true with what happens at the end of this passage not giving back to the landlord what we owe to him yeah making sense so far good that's positive so who came to him it's the Sanhedrin it's the it's if you go back and look at the preceding context it says here later they sent some of who is it go back you track it back to 11 27 to 28 and it is the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the people it's the three sorts of people who together make up the Jewish ruling council they the religious leaders are the ones who are giving Jesus the trouble because he's been trying to restore the vineyard to God and get the rent that's due. They sent the Pharisees and they sent the Herodians together. These two rival parties who have a different take on virtually everything, including how you relate to the Roman state that's come in and taken over. So whichever way Jesus goes, he's got opponents in the group that are coming to him. Does that make sense? You can see what's going on. And how do they come to him? They come to him with flattery. The, the, the worst thing you can have as a preacher is somebody saying nice things to you. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't take it the wrong way. But you see, watch it. You see these young... Oh, he's going to throw something. You see these young guys who go along somewhere and, and they get this tremendous... Oh, that was wonderful. And it, that's the last thing they need to hear. And very often as a preacher, it's the last thing you need to hear. Um, you, you see it immensely more through social media and on Twitter 
you know a guy recently great guy real trophy of grace this guy serving God really well in a hard place he wrote a blog and it was touching and it was moving but all of a sudden you see people all over that and they're, they're flattering you can't help concluding they're flattering and what's it going to do to that guy how's it going to help him in his heart and soul and, and, and you find yourself praying they come to Jesus to flatter him but in this case they're flattering him to butter him up to do something else to him you know and it's flattering let's get his pride going then we'll undercut him and make him look stupid so verse 14a they came to him they said teacher we know now look at what they pick out you are a man of integrity you aren't swayed by others you pay no attention to who they are but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth bear those things in mind stick that in the back of the head because the Inquisition is coming along with all those things from that sort of background but then they come with this challenge is it right to pay taxes to Caesar you're a teacher you're a truthful man you're not swayed by power and authority we know you're impartial here verses 13 and 14 comes the attack the attack flattery then attack they came verse 13 d to trap him with words it says trap him with words they're not concerned with truth they're concerned with words you can get that in a religious context Jesus is having to deal with that and the challenge they put verse 14 B is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not now as we've said that splits the group that have come with a question it splits the Herodians and the Pharisees and quite possibly it splits Jesus's popular support base because there would be those in his audience who would take a different view on whether you should or shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar we know amongst his disciples he's got zealots Simon the zealot was a guy who'd go around you know stabbing Romans kind of thing um, and you've got people like Matthew the tax collector yeah it's a real divisive thing isn't it very divisive thing and of course it's a threat to Jesus's life from chapter 11 verse 18 they've been out to take his life because he's threatened the good little number they've got going with their religion they've, they've got it going their way they're defending having it their way they want it they like it the way it is and they are murderous in their response to Jesus coming with truth from God murderous and sometimes we see that too where people have insisted on having it their way in their church for their purposes the parable of the tenant refers to that in chapter ch tenants refers to that in chapter 12 verses 7 to 8 because finally God sends them a son yeah the, finally no finally the landlord sends his son and they say come on let's take him out let's take him out if we can't shut him up if we can't stop him coming to us and saying bear fruit let's take him out and this is their response to the parable is this this mission to try and catch him Jesus has told this parable saying that's what they're going to do with the son and there he is the son and here they've come to get him killed it's ironic isn't it there's the inquisition here's his response he saw through their hypocrisy verses 15 to 16 he saw through their hypocrisy verse 15a somebody showed me recently oh, it was in a blog post or something um, A sort of a page of a Bible and it said um, what most people think the Bible says about judgment and there was a whole page from a particular chapter and everything on the page had been crossed out with sort of magic marker except the bit that said judge not now scripture does say judge not that you be not judged but it means something specific in the context and people have just taken the whole of the Bible as you know, judgment. That is now the authoritative word. 
judge not. And Jesus sees through their hypocrisy, which is not a pretty word, but it's an accurate word to describe what he's looking at. He exposes it. It is an expose that Jesus does on what's coming at him. He exposes it. He saw through their hypocrisy, and verse 15b, he, uh, he outs their sin. How does he do that? He says, um, this temple tax you're talking about, this uh, tax to Caesar that you're talking about, has anybody got a copy of the coin we need to pay it with? And the Pharisees and, and whoever's there, the, the, the two groups, the Herodians and so on, they, um, they go through their pockets and they pull out a coin. And Jesus says, oh, that's interesting. Let's have a look at the coin. Uh, what have we got on here? Whose inscription is this? Whose image is this? Whose head is on it? And what does it say around the outside? Uh, and, and the head that's on it is the head of the emperor. And the inscription around the outside says that he is a god. The Roman coin and the teaching of the Jewish leaders of the day was not to be touched because it was unclean. And by saying, oh, has anybody got a denarius? Jesus has got them to pull out of their pocket the very thing that they were teaching the people they shouldn't have. It's a big expose, do you see? He's exposed them in their hypocrisy. He outs their hypocrisy, challenges their sin, catches them in their hypocrisy, and then teaches, verse 17, he teaches them the truth. Teaches them the truth. It's Caesar's money. Give it to Caesar. You shouldn't be touching it. You shouldn't want it. You shouldn't be holding on to the things that you're holding on to. They are not yours, you Jewish religious leaders. That's what the incident up at the temple was all about. Give it to Caesar. But then, and this is the way that you know, the Lord graciously teaches truth out of an appalling situation, but give God what is God's. That's the problem with what was happening at the temple. They were having it their way, not God's way. That's the problem with the religion that says, I want it like I get my burgers any way I want. It's for me. What belongs to God gives to God. Give him the fruit, the share crop of the vineyard back to God what you owe Caesar give Caesar it's his but give God what is God's what, what, what is that what you, what you owe God that's the issue here isn't it that's the big issue that he's got to come back to as tenants in his vineyard we share crop religion their religion doesn't give it back to him religion is mine discipleship gives to God what is God's it doesn't do what Tim Keller was talking about earlier on making things that are good the ultimate thing it makes things that are ultimate the ultimate and that is the absence of idolatry not its presence actually have you noticed Jesus has given them back exactly what they flattered him with doesn't care who they are he teaches them the truth. He isn't swayed by men or their power or authority or the threat that they pose. He exposes in the interest of serving God's greater truth. How do you handle religious hypocrisy? Graciously expose and teach truth. What is, what is the effect of all of this? it says they were utterly amazed by Jesus it's not a good word it's not a good word they were staggered by him but they weren't changed and sometimes when we expose 
religious hypocrisy and deliver gracious truth into it, people are staggered and that's part of the process. That's part of the process. And sometimes they're saved. Jesus is in that phase of his ministry, which we have to refer to as his conflict ministry. He's had his Galilean ministry. Everybody calls the Galilean ministry that. It's when he appears on the scene and he preaches the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, and then shows that he is the coming king who's bringing in his kingdom. Right through to chapter 8, verses 28 to 32, where Peter then says, you are the king who is coming in his kingdom. And then Jesus says, as you know, the second act of Mark's gospel, you know very well, it says, uh, well, this is the sort of king who's coming. This is what's going to characterize his ministry. He's going to be despised and rejected just the way the, the person in that vineyard, the son in the vineyard was in the parable. And then the third section from, you know, where Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem in, in ch chapter 11 takes place onwards begins his conflict ministry. Where he's up against the conflict of the, the workers, uh, the, the tenants in the vineyard who will not have it God's way and kick it back. Look at the churches in our land, tell me what's going on. They kick it back because they want it their way. And Jesus simply confronts and exposes and teaches the truth. And he has to go on doing that for a little while. But he's the one who writes the book on conflict ministry. You don't know, actually, where conflict ministry is going. Nobody calls it his conflict ministry, as far as I know. That's sort of, sorry, sorry, that's, that's my identification. But that's what's happening in this third act of Mark's Gospel. They're utterly amazed at Jesus. They're staggered that he's got the front. They've got all sorts of criticism and bitterness and things to hurl. And they seem to be utterly unchanged by the encounter. But then there's Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Has anybody got that? Could somebody find that for me? Because I'll just quote it off the top of my head and that might not be the best thing. Here's what happens after Pentecost, after loads of the ordinary people become Christians, after the, the, the stoning of Stephen is coming up, after the whipping and the flogging and, the, and the, the coming out of prison of Peter being led out by the angel, by the persecution, the continued persecution of the early church by these people, this Sanhedrin, Acts chapter 6 describes the appointment of the deacons, those, those to serve the church, look after the widows and whatever, and then it says Acts 6-7. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied and Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the to the Right, can, can we get that absolutely clearly? The church grew, there were many who became disciples of Christ, and a great number of the priests became obedient to Christ. These guys. These guys who were standing around that day, seeing now their place in the parable of the tenants, seeing the truth of what Jesus was saying here, that you give to Caesar what Caesar's, but boys, you better be on top of giving to God what is God's. And a great number of them became obedient to the faith. Here's where we are. Around us, we've got many a manifestation of, I want my burger my way. I want my church my way. It's idolatry in the terms that Tim Keller is describing there in that video about uh, the New City Catechism. It takes sometimes that conflict ministry to just expose and graciously handle, not look for conflict, but it'll find you. Expose and teach truth. And maybe they're going to be utterly amazed and maybe they're going to look completely unchanged by the encounter, but let's not forget Acts 6 7 must have been a brilliant place for that early church to go and see the immense grace of God in the gospel. They've murdered the Son, and the Father is gracious still.
Herr Gott,